I mean, I think the thing that uh, Steve was talking about uh, and, and his background kind of mirror a little bit of my background. Um, and I think the interesting thing is smart orchardists are not very comfortable with where we're at uh, in terms of what we're doing to the soil biology especially. So I think you heard a lot of questions from Steve to Michael about what's going on, what can we be doing, and I think we're all looking for solutions, and I'll be the first to admit that what I'm gonna lay out here today in terms of I was tasked with talking about a spray program, um, I think I, I wanna talk a little bit more broadly about what it's gonna to take to grow good fruit, but again, this is a snapshot of where we're at today I am fourth generation in my family growing fruit. Uh, I used to run over a thousand acres. Uh, that is not a very good lifestyle and uh, a lot of challenges there, especially in the 90s when I was doing that. And I'll be the first to admit that we are trying to transition out of that, but not anywhere as close to where we could or should be. So here we go. Um, I think for a lot of people in this room, it seems like our, our sort of early stage or thinking about growing. So I just wanna emphasize, do everything you can to make your life easy because fruit growing is not, um, especially in this part of the world. I mean, I always think that those guys out in Washington have life way too easy. They don't have a lot of the disease and insect pressures that we have. And I think we really should export some of that to them. Um, <laughs> Disease resistant cultivars, to me it's a no brainer if you're thinking at all about going into organic production. I don't know why anybody wouldn't. The early varieties of that I think were less than great. Prima, Pristilla, the PRI kind of cultivars, uh, you know, as a fresh apple, they just weren't that great. Liberty came out as a rock star. You know, it's an easy grower tree, but it's a lot it's, it's pretty tart in profile for a lot of, of our UPIC customers. Um, some of the later releases like Crimson Crisp and Gold Rush, uh, I mean, people just go crazy over these things and I don't know uh, why you wouldn't wanna plant them right off the, right off the bat. Uh, Crimson Crisp is a little bit of a, of a difficult tree to grow. Uh, Gold Rush is like God's gift to Orchardists. Um, Geneva rootstocks, the same sort of thing. I mean, I don't know why anybody in today's world would plant a fire blight, in this climate, would plant a fire blight susceptible rootstock if you can get the equivalent in a Geneva rootstock. Um, in addition, as we get into renewing uh, dwarf trees, I mean, that's one of the things about dwarf orchards is a lot of times they're coming out after 15 or 20 years, and then you have apple replant disease and things like that. A lot of the new Geneva cultivars in the rootstocks are actually uh, tolerant to replant situations. And so that replaces the need to have to get into, you know, nuclear war in your soils. Um, and then, you know, we all make mistakes. Uh, but if you're planting Bud 9 and Honeycrisp and expecting to grow a 10-foot tree, well, just good luck to you, you know? I mean, it, it just ain't gonna happen, you know, unless you're a way, unless you're just force-feeding nitrogen to these trees, um, it, it's not gonna happen. So, so think about, you know, what your, what your tree cultivar wants to be in terms of the size of the tree and think about matching that with a rootstock and a planting density that makes some sense. Um, we have planted orchards that we want to be seven feet tall. We don't want to do any picking above pedestrian levels. And maybe a bud nine on honey, with Honeycrisp, you could do that if you didn't crop them for the first three years or something. But, you know, it's, it's just always a good idea to think the, about the first three things before you plant. And if you don't think about the fourth thing in Iowa, 
well, then you may as well just not be in the orchard business. You got to get rid of deer. I mean, there's just no replacement for that. I don't know what it's like here, but in Iowa City, where we're kind of at the borders of woodland and prairie, um, the deer do better than humans by a long shot. So we really, um, we bought an orchard from a guy that believed that he could keep deer out by putting PVC, crossing PVC above above young trees. And those trees were 10 years old and probably two foot high. Um, we have seen electric fence trials at, in Michigan. Um, and in the middle of looking at the, at the trials, we saw deer running through high tensile fencing. Um, I mean, high tensile woven wire fencing is, to my way of thinking, the only way worth keeping deer out. It's not the cheapest way to go, but if you do the work yourself, you do not need much in the way of posts. The, the fencing, all you got to do is keep the fencing up. And in fact, now they make, we started to use 10 foot T posts. And uh, that works just fine. About every third post, you put a wood one in. And we use three inch top uh, uh, treated posts for the wood, not the big five inch ones. Works perfect. Um, they talk about being able to drive a car at 50 miles an hour into, into this kind of fencing and bouncing the car back. Um, it's very strong. We've had three foot oak trees fall on it and it'll fall to the ground, it'll break the post, but you get the tree off and it'll pop back up. You might have a few broken strands, but we've never been able to break it. Uh, and it, it keeps the deer out uh, on our one farm we have two places where we cross what is essentially a small river. That's a struggle. But everywhere else where we use eight foot high woven wire deer fence with 12 inch stays, we haven't had a bit of problem with deer. The bigger problem actually is getting coyotes into your place because these woven wires have smaller, um, they, they, they start at like three inches between the vertical rungs or the horizontal rungs and it'll exclude coyotes and let rabbits in. So we've had to open up holes for coyotes to, to let them in and, and, and let them keep the, the rabbits down. Build strong trellis. Uh, I don't think you can possibly have started 20 years ago in the orchard business uh, planting high density and not have had a, a trellis fail. Everybody's done it. and. Uh, Mike Malik is here. I was really amazed at the trellis he built. He built dang good trellis. Uh, if you want a good example of good trellis, go see him. Do your tiling. I mean, if it's wet ground uh, and you don't tile it early, I, I won't say that. Yeah, I will say I, I, this is from personal experience. Um, tile it early on. Tiling it later doesn't. It works, but it's, it tears everything up and it doesn't. By that time, your trees are, are pretty well sunk. Bud nine, by the way, is a, is a rootstock that has a lot of great characteristics. But boy, I'll tell you what, if you runt it out or if you let it get wet feet even one time, that thing does not want to come back. Um, so that's, it's a great rootstock for certain situations in our climate. But uh, boy, if you are going to plant bud nine, get it tiled if it's, if it's at all soggy soil. The right quality trees. So we, we were talking yesterday a little bit about cider apple varieties. And it's a fact of life that, you know, if you want a really high quality tree, unfortunately we can't buy them in Europe. I was over in Europe and you can buy a tree that's six foot high, three foot feathers, 20 feathers, $3.75 for that tree. Here you can't find that tree at all. But to the extent you can, they're out on the west coast and they're not growing these cider apples, they're not growing Liberty, they're not growing Gold Rush. So we tend to get trees, especially in the cider apple world, we're getting trees that come and they look like a raspberry bush or something. You know, I mean, they're just not nice trees. They're a spindly little thing. Get the best trees you can, okay? Plant straight rows, I, I just, I mean, you know, I, I saw Michael saying, and that's, that's great, but if you wanna be driving you know, tractors down this, down this row with a mower, and especially if you want to hire somebody for 12 bucks an hour to do it, and you don't want them taking out three trees in every row each time, plant straight rows to where they can just 
put her on autopilot and kind of cruise down the roads. All right. These are kind of a <coughs> litany of our major insects. We do get a lot of tarnished plant bug around us. We have a lot of hay fields. Every time they mow hay, we get tarnished plant bugs moving in. Um, Rosy apple aphid is not a, a major problem, except in, in, uh, in um, early, early season growth stuff. Um, Cuculio is a problem for us for sure. Coddling moth, definitely. OFM is, is uh, as Michael alluded to, more of a problem in areas that have a lot of peaches. We do get occasional wheat still trap for them. Japanese beetles are, you know, the big nuisance pests that everybody, uh, we, so our biggest, op, our biggest uh, way of selling apples is through UPIC, and that's the one that everybody asks about every year. Like, what do you do with these Japanese beetles? And da, 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 da. So we've gone to recommending that people that want to put those traps that lure them in do that on their neighbor's trees so that they take them over there. Um, we, to be quite honest, uh, Japanese beetles for us are very much uh, variety specific. You can look down a row, you can see our orchard sits down over a valley and you can look probably 800 yards away, you can spot every single Honeycrisp tree. You can spot every Liberty tree because that's the ones they love. They have recently learned to like Sweet 16, unfortunately, which was sort of our second most popular variety. Um, but by and large, Japanese beetles are variety specific and mostly, not always, but they're a much bigger problem where we have a lot more vigorous growth. So we have a lot of stuff on M7. And Honeycrisp on N7, by the way, is a great combination. I really like that. I mean, it, I don't like M7 as a, as a rule, but Honeycrisp, M7, great combination. Um, Japanese beetles love it, and because that's the few Honeycrisp trees that have any real growth are on M7. Um, but we kind of figure it's doing a little summer pruning for us, and why not? You know, the only, the only time they actually bother apples for us, we still grow some Lodi's, and they will devour a Lodi apple tree. Um, or not tree, but they'll actually devour the fruit. You know, you'll have the hull of an apple, the skin, and inside is nothing but Japanese beetles. It's amazing, yeah, it's nasty. Um, we do have some stink bugs moving in. I don't know if you guys are in the orchard business, you're gonna start to see more and more stink bugs. This one is a real problem for us because unlike Japanese beetles, you have to get rid of them if you want commercial grade fruit because they'll put all kinds of dimples and all kinds of sort of uh, corky spots in your apples. And any true bug or any beetle is not gonna be easy to kill. I mean, it just ain't, you know, it's, it's, there's not a lot of soft stuff that kills a stink bug. And then you start spraying hard stuff to kill that and you start messing with all of the other litany of, of, of critters that I haven't put on here because we don't worry about them anymore. We don't worry about leaf rollers. We don't worry about mites because the good guys take care of all that stuff for you. But once you start screwing with your IPM program to kill stink bugs, then you, this list becomes three times as long and five times more difficult. Okay, I wanna talk, oh, and then diseases, yeah, so. I think everybody's familiar with scab. Fire blight, we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Cedar apple rust. Sooty blotch and fly speck are kind of interesting. Um, so we bought an orchard that was 20 years old, all on M7, and the guy had had some health problems and hadn't sprayed at all that year, had, and didn't believe in pruning, and when we got it, the sooty blotch was so bad it looked like you had sprayed that, what is it, kale and clay kind of stuff, but it was gray. It looked like somebody sprayed ash on this stuff. Every single apple had, was just covered with black sooty stuff. Um, the smaller trees that he had planted uh, a few years before that didn't have any real problems with that. And what we see in this climate, I, I grew up in Michigan, so sooty blotch fly speck, if you didn't spray for summer diseases there and you were in the southern part of the state where they were a problem, 
you were, you know, you were going to have a lot of unmarketable fruit, basically. Um, I know you can wash it off and all that stuff. So people don't want to do that, and it's not as easy as they say to wash it off. Um, but uh, what I have seen is on our dwarf plantings, sooty blotch and fly speck are almost never a problem. Almost because I would have said that definitively until this year when we had a lot of late season, unusual late season rains. And we did get some sooty blotch and fly speck coming in. But even so, the amount of it compared to a heavier canopied apple tree is considerably different. We do see with our warmer summer temperatures a lot more of the rots coming in. And this is a huge problem because, you know, we were pretty proud of ourselves of being able to put the sprayer away pretty much midsummer. Uh, and we just didn't worry about summer diseases. But now with some of these uh, rots coming back in, that's not such an easy uh, win for us. So we're not quite sure where we're going to end up on, on that one. Um, yep. Oops. Okay, um, oops, sorry. So there's a lot of new information about spraying and, and uh, you know, when I grew up, you wanted the biggest sprayer you could possibly get and you wanted to go as fast as you possibly could because there was beer to be drank and stuff like that. You didn't want to be out spraying. So, uh, but there is a lot of new information about just how much you want to depend on turbulence and how much how many CFMs you want to be blowing, and I'm, I don't have a good memory anyways, but if you want information about that, I would strongly recommend Cornell. Cornell's done some good work in this area. Washington State's doing some good work in this area. Um, if you haven't bought a sprayer and you're thinking of getting in the commercial orchard, do look at that and try and figure it out. This is an old economist that I had. We retrofitted a tower onto it. Um, it does a really nice job on our stuff. Our stuff is mostly, uh, you know, trellis, 10 to 12 foot high trees. This does a really nice job of pretty evenly distributing the spray. We, we, uh, we vary the speed with the season. As we get more leaf surface, we tend to slow down. So pretty much after petal fall, we're starting to slow down. Um, but early season, we go every other middle. We don't even spray every tree row. Um, and we can go like four miles an hour. Um, but later on, we slow down and try and get everything sprayed well. Um, you, it, it is a good idea. And one of the things tower sprayers can allow you to do for scab control in particular and for thinning. So a lot of the early season stuff, you want to have a heavier dosage up above to let rain and, and moisture work stuff down because that's the way the, the, uh, the uh, scab spores will, will tend to rain down. So um, we like to, to gear it to where we have flip over nozzles and we can increase the amount of material that we put in the top of the tree versus the bottom. Um, we use 50 gallons per minute as a standard for water delivery. We calibrate every year. Um, that's just us. Uh, we'll talk in a minute here a little bit more about that. And in our uh, situation, we have really hilly farms. Uh, if we didn't have a four-wheel drive tractor, we wouldn't be able to get to a lot of it when you need to. You need a good, a good cap. I mean, I grew up in the orchard business. It's the worst part of growing apples to me, with, without a doubt, is, is putting all these chemicals on. and you know, the person that's doing it most often, it's getting the biggest exposure is not your customer, it's you. So, you know, when we're mixing, we're putting masks on and stuff like that, because that's when you're really dealing with concentrated product. And then, you know, if you're going up and down 40 acres, uh, you're gonna get a good dose of that stuff uh, if you don't have a good cap. So, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about tree row volume. Um, one of the things about coming to Iowa is that I've encountered quite a few growers that don't truly understand about uh, applying sprays. Uh, they don't understand about this thing about gallons per acre and gallons of dilute equivalent per acre. Okay, so wh what I would strongly encourage people is to figure out, get, get to thinking about about 
pounds of product or quarts of product per acre that you're going to try and apply. Okay, that's because this can get fairly confusing. All right, um, you have the the basic idea here behind tree row volume is that if you're spraying a little bush or you're spraying a big tree, obviously you need more product to cover them. So if you're spraying a tree that's great big standard tree, you would need 300 to 400, depending on whose figures you use, 300 to 400 gallons of water to get that to where you've completely covered all the leaf surface. Whereas if you're spraying a small dwarf tree, you only may need 100 gallons per water to completely cover that tree. Well, if you, if you need that much more water, you also need that much more spray material. All right, so that's the, basis, uh, idea, the basic idea behind tree row volume. One of the advantages of dwarf fruit trees, to my way of thinking, number one, you, less pruning, but number two, you can really cut back on the amount of spray material that you need to grow a set amount of fruit. I think that is by far, you know, this is a Honeycrisp on M7. That is a probably Honeycrisp on uh, Geneva 11. Um, and there's just night and day difference between how much spray we have to put on this. We consider this about a 50% tree row volume, and that's 25%. So we would put on 50%, if, if let's say you're spraying Captan 80WG at three pounds per acre, that's full rate, we would cut it back to a pound and a half per acre for this, and we'd cut it back to uh, three quarters of a pound for that. And that's the basis. Um, there's all kinds of formulas. I'll, I'll, at the end of this presentation, I give a few um, ideas about where you go for more information. But you know, there's that internet thing. You can get on. You can figure all this stuff out. Super easy. Um, just the the mistake a lot of people make is that spray materials are often given in so much per hundred gallons. So they go out and load up their 150 gallon sprayer with one and a half times that amount of product and think they're just gonna cruise through the orchard and they don't understand that that is dilute equivalent, not the amount that you should put in a set amount of water, but rather the amount that would go into a certain size tree. All right, I'm getting lots of blank stares, so I'm gonna move on. Um, I think, uh, I think I, I, can say that there are a lot of people, especially in the Midwest, that are very uncomfortable with commercial orcharding as, it's, as we grew up with, and are very interested in stuff like, like Michael is doing and trying to figure out how to make a more sustainable uh, apple growing culture. Um, so in the meantime, we're just trying to figure out how to not make so many mistakes, right? And like I said at the beginning, you know, we're trying to sort of take bits and pieces uh, that we can easily incorporate in. And as of yet, we have yet to deal with the most difficult one, which I think is still how we deal with the soil micro microbiology. Um, but above the ground, we can do some things. Um, a few of them, uh, of course, you got a trap to monitor pests. If you don't know, you know, when I grew up, you sprayed by the calendar. It was this week, you're going to spray that, and this week, you're going to spray that. Your crop consultant came out, loaded you up, and off you went. But, of course, a much smarter way is to know what actually is in your orchard, not just the bad guys, but especially the good guys, and be able to expect what's going to happen. We live in a world where we have a lot of good information now. We have a lot of good systems for predicting what, what's likely to happen with insect populations and disease populations, um, I strongly recommend NEWA or getting your own weather station. NEWA is a really great, that's this network for environment and weather applications. Uh, it, was, it was started by Cornell. It goes all across the United States right now. They get data from a lot of airports, weather data. So they monitor leaf wetness, they monitor humidity, they monitor temperature, they monitor wind, so they can predict how long something is gonna be, how warm, they can predict how long something is gonna be, how wet in your orchard. 
and they have already preloaded uh, predictive programs for a lot of different insects and like fire blight, apple scab, uh, summer diseases, all that stuff's preloaded. It makes it so super simple. If you happen to live, as I am lucky to, near two of the airports that cooperate with them. If not, um, well, you can do your own weather station, do the same thing. It's just a lot more like work because you got to either get out there or spend thousands of dollars in doing something that you can do from your phone or go out and physically download the data every day or every couple days. But that stuff is really good at helping you predict when and if you have to put something on to control the critters. Um, a couple of the things that we've done very successfully um, in combining organic practices into our operation, um, we really like mating disruption for coddling moth. Uh, works very well. You got to have a sort of 10 acre block to, to make it work, but it's worked super well. Um, the little twist high things, we kind of like more. We have used the puffers. Um, we did see some collie moth coming through on the puffers, so we've gone back to the twist ties. Um, we've used graniosis virus uh, for collie moth as well. It, it works well, it's just um, we tend to get a fair bit of rain about the time that, that, is, is, uh, that we're putting that on. It tends to come off more, so we've really liked the, the um, mating disruption a lot more. Um, as well, we're really, I mean, the biggest change that's happened in my lifetime is that we're going a lot more towards targeted materials. So if you want to, if you want to get a, a specific insect, you use a specific material that is going to attack that one and leave the predators that would help you out in that battle alone. And it's not, unfortunately, always something that you can do, but to the extent that you can, I think that is a fantastic way. And unfortunately, I mean, the, the neonicotoids offered a lot of help in this area, but now we gotta kinda, we gotta kinda tiptoe around the fact that neonicotoids also affect bees quite, quite dramatically. So uh, this is another challenge. I mean, like I said, I mean, if you, haven't, if you haven't planted trees so far, you just rethink the whole decision. Um, <laughs> Resist it. So in my past life, I, I managed a great big orchard operation. It was the first one in the United States. It had the dubious distinction being the first one in the United States to become uh, immune or resistant to streptomycin for fire blight. They had a 20-acre uh, crabapple orchard that they used to use, and this was a crabapple variety that, I mean, a lot of them don't get fire blight, but this one happened to get fire blight like big time, and they would just routinely spray strep in it whether they needed to or not. And uh, that was the first orchard in the United States to get streptomycin resistance, which is a huge blow. Um, similarly, um, the guys I grew up with in Michigan, again, we were all interested in, in uh, hitting the streets and drinking the beers. So if we could get a sterile inhibitor on there and wait seven days and then go back and put another one on there seven days later, uh, or even 14 days later, hey, that was the greatest thing. Let's just do sterile inhibitors start to, to finish. So pretty, pretty soon, the strobarillums were the first ones we lost. Sterile inhibitors came after that. But, you know, there's a parade of materials that poorly managed, and herbicides, of course, in the same category, poorly managed become unavailable to you, okay? Um, the way I look at it, these are all good things in moderation. You just got to be thinking a little bit about where you put what. There's some information that sterile inhibitors uh, combined with neonicotoids are particularly dangerous to bees. So we've gone away from that because we used to, we always uh, stop spraying well in advance of bloom and we try and extend as close to petal fall, well, as, as far beyond petal fall as we can before we start spraying again, just to protect bees. And uh, sterile inhibitors were great because they would give you up to four days of back action if you did get a, 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 an infection in there, a scab infection at that time. But we've had to back off from that now because of this stuff. So um, in our orchards, again, we have, we have bees that we keep right there. We, um, we have a huge, 
we're surrounded by woods at one orchard completely. Um, and there's, uh, they've done an assay with 23 different species of, of, of native bees. So we're very acutely interested in maintaining bee populations. And sterile inhibitors combined with neonicotinoids seem like a, a really bad move towards that. Um, to avoid resistance, number one, uh, spray to kill. I mean, if you're going to get out there and get, get chemicals on, do enough to kill what you're going to kill. You know, don't do it half-hearted because you just build up a resistant population. Um, good coverage is extremely important to this. Proper timing is extremely important to this. And then again, you know, you want to be just using your brain a little bit and, and have materials that have differing modes of action. It's particularly important on, um, on insects that populate quickly and on uh, weeds. All right, so this, I think, I think I saw somebody have one of these handed out, so I'm not going to go into great detail about this. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things. If you see, so I, I've divided this up between our dwarf orchards and our semi-dwarfs. I'm going back to this thing that I'm probably beaten to death, but that, you know, there is the ability to reduce the amount that you spray based on the size of your trees. So if you see over there on the left, there says, what we're trying, at Silver Chip, we're trying to control fire blight and scab. We've got 20 acres. The rate percentage, that means that's a dwarf orchard, so we're going 25% of the amount per acre. Champ is a copper material. Normally, full, full blown, three quarts per acre. But if you do that math, that would be 60 quarts. 20 acres times three quarts would be 60 quarts. We're, we're spraying 15 uh, quartz on that 20 acres because it's only, you know, these are, are relatively small trees. I will say we really like copper early season for fire, but fire blight's a huge problem for us. And it seems like it's not going to become less of a problem uh, for two reasons. One is we're getting warmer springs, and the second is we're planting cider apples. Cider apples are like God's gift to the fire blight world, you know. I mean, they, they Fire blight loves these things. They tend to bloom really late, and um, they tend to bloom just about the time temperatures are getting into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and they tend to bloom right when we're starting to get these rains and light, light very uh, either heavy fogs or light misty rains, which you know is just perfect for that. We like copper. We wait. We don't do a dormant copper. We actually wait until about a quarter inch of green is showing on them buds, you can't go much beyond that or you get rusting on your fruit, but we go as late as we can and we consider that our first uh, scab spray. After that, for, insect, or for disease control, we get into the EBDCs, you know, the polyrams and, and manzates and that stuff of the world. Um, just because they're good protectants, again, we used to start with, with uh, uh, sterile inhibitors and stroborillums and stuff and um, we've gotten away from that a lot. The other thing that we're doing, um, I, I actually am, am rethinking some of this, but uh, that again, tarnished plant bugs is a real problem for us. We, we have found that a sale, which is a neonicotinoid, works really good for them. Um, a sale preserves a lot of the predators that help take care of rosy apple aphids. So it'll kill the rosies, but not kill a lot of the predators that feed on rosies. So that's, that's been a good program for us. And we used to run that at Petal Fall as well. But like I said, now we're backing off from that. And I wish, so if you look at Petal Fall, that's pink and Petal Fall are the two most important insect sprays for us. Um, and for lack of a better option right now, we're using Imidan, which of course, is, uh, is an OP. It's, it's not a good product. We want to get away from organophosphates. Um, but that's where we're at right now. Again, we're a work in progress. Uh, you'll see a lot of CACL. Um, we do put a lot of calcium on Honeycrisp variety, Honeycrisp and some other varieties. Uh, Sweet 16 is another one we do. John of Gold's another one, um, just for bitter pit. Um, Later season, you see we start the rally is a sterile inhibitor. We'll start to mix that in 
to the mix. It just gives us a much longer span between what we call for, you know, we used to call, in Michigan we would have like seven covers. Now if, if I go through three covers or maybe four, it's, it's really unusual for us to go to four. So um, we have cut down the number of sprays by being able to, to extend the time between those sprays. Sterile inhibitors can help you a lot in that regard. Um, right, I'm gonna move on here just because you guys can ask questions later. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is the semi-dwarf orchard, you'll see, so instead of 25%, we're using a lot of the same materials, just not uh, at, at twice the amount per acre because the trees are twice as big. Uh, we went through this. I mean, it, it's not rocket science, right? Um, but I, I will just say that in my lifetime, having grown up in a culture, you know, it, where I grew up in Michigan, is like apples are like corn and beans are here. Everybody grows apples. And so it's like my dad used to say, the best apple growers are the ones that didn't ever grow up in an apple farm because they think differently. And there's a lot of truth to that. One of the things I grew up with is a, you know, nuclear program against bugs. Every bug is a bad bug. You know, there was no scouting, no nothing. And uh, we've come to see firsthand, and I don't just mean we as in our orchard, but I mean even the Michigan industry, the, everybody scouts. Everybody is looking at what's out there. And to varying degrees, people are looking at how to preserve beneficial insects, okay? I mean, it's just a fact of life. Um, one thing, sprays aren't cheap, and the second thing, nobody really wants to do it, you know? I mean, it's, it's just... Uh, not, not something anybody wants to go out and say, I want to really put some chemicals on today. Um, the other thing that we do, um, so again, good timing, that's all based on, on uh, knowing what's out there, using trapping, um, targeted spraying. Uh, we don't do a lot of that in terms of like spot spraying, um, except for fire blight, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, Forbs, you know, non-grasses in alleyways, we believe are essential to, pre to maintaining some, some um, diversity and also just, just some habitat for some of the better beneficial insects. Um, along those lines, uh, while Steve was here, we were having a little conversation about planting alleyways. We really like low-growing grasses like perennial rye, uh, red fescue does well for us. Uh, and then we mix into that some of the clovers, and that makes a really nice ecosystem and a very low growing one. So in the orchards that we've planted uh, in the last 10 years, we may mow them twice a year. You know, so reducing the mowing, I think Michael alluded to this, you know, it, it just seems to help everything out. Now, if we could mow it and blow it under the tree rows, that's our next move to help build up some organic matter because Right now, we do uh, do a lot of herbicide under the trees, and like I say, that's the sort of next frontier for us, figuring out how to do that. But for now, low-growing stuff that we don't have to be in there with the mower, number one, smaller carbon footprint, not running the mower all the time, uh, less labor at times that are not convenient, uh, less mowing when conditions are wet means less compaction. Um, you know, I mean, there's some very obvious, easy things that we can do to just to, to just uh, uh, make life better, make a better ecosystem within our orchards. Accepting some damage. Um, this is something that, for me, growing up, and you know, I, I've got a brother who grew uh, an orchard of Red Delicious back in the day when Red Delicious were king. And this orchard was 45 acres, and they picked uh, in one day, they picked 140 boxes, that's 20 bushel boxes of apples and ran them over a packing line. They had four apples that did not meet number one grade out of that gazillion apples, right? That's the kind of results that Washington growers and Michigan growers, I mean, that's extreme, but it, it's, it's and aided by the fact that Red Delicious have a skin that nothing would want to eat. But, um, <laughs> but that's the kind of results, you know, when I grew up, early days, if you had 50% packouts, that was pretty good, you know, because there was a great market for juice apples, there was a great market for, for peelers and stuff like that. Nowadays, that world doesn't exist, you know, the China and their, 
and their booming uh, production of concentrate has eroded that. I will say that now with hard cider, it's changed a little bit. But uh, the interest in having blemish-free fruit is something that I grew up with. Having a U-pick operation, you do see that people are interested and willing to buy somewhat damaged fruit. The only caveat that I want to make to that is there's a real limit. And, and there's a lot more. It's kind of like Dieter will probably uh, 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 agree with this. You know, when you're sampling hard cider and everybody's coming up and saying, I really want the dry one. I really want the dry one. And then you give them the dry one, they're like, what else you got, you know? And it's kind of like that with damaged fruit. It's like, I really don't want you spraying. I really don't mind damaged fruit. But then we, we let people pick out their own fruit if they don't want to go out in the orchard and pick. We'll, we'll let them. And I'll tell you what, they pick through it mercilessly. You know, they're used to the produce aisle where everything looks perfect. So accepting some damage is more, I think, a commitment by the grower. And it's something that we need to do. Um, our commitment long term is to really get away from spraying uh, commercial pesticides, but in order to do that, we're going to have to really accept that our grower, or that our customers are going to buy fruit that doesn't look as good. I mean, I most of the organic operations that I know of, whether Harry Hoke or Jim Cohen, depend a lot on their cider as a way of mopping up that fruit that they can't sell outside of there. And right now, most of our sales are fresh fruit. Uh, mating, yep. Okay, so thinning. Um, in the Fruit Ridge area of Michigan, they said this thinning time was the time when most divorces happened in, in apple farms. And that's true. I mean, it, it's just, you know, you're thinking about taking your crop that's hanging there and cutting it down by maybe 80%, right? And if you overdo it, it goes to 100%. If you underdo it, you got huge cost to, to thin them by hand. Um, but in today's world, thinning is the only way that you can produce the kind of big fruit with nice color, nice sugars, you know, some varieties like Honeycrisp and stuff, they do not flavor up well if you let them have a full crop. It's not just you lose next year's cropping, you have fruit that just is tasteless. You know, there's only so many carbohydrates that tree can make. So, um, yeah, so thinning is a must. And you, you really need to know, um, there's some fantastic research that's done on carbohydrate production. I was super interested in what Michael had to say today about what's going on underground and the ebbs and flows. But if you look at the carbohydrate production models that you know people at Michigan State like Phil Schweier or a lot of the people at Cornell have done, and there's some great models that, are, that have gone on, you guys can get online and, and check all that out. But long story short, at, by the time post bloom your fruit like michael said you know all of that energy that goes into growing those small that that goes into bloom and goes into growing that small fruit it's all stored energy right the the tree isn't making it yet you know it's putting out them little spur leaves at first but they're not making much and not nearly enough to cover this gas guzzler that's the bloom and that's the young fruit right so about the time they get to 10 millimeters about the the tip of your little finger there, um, that's where the maximum amount of, of, um, of uh, pressure is in the tree. They're, they're just about out of gas in terms of stored carbohydrates. They're not yet quite starting to produce a lot of their own carbohydrates. That's when thinner does the best job. You heard Steve yesterday, if you were not sleeping, talk about spraying thinners several times. And uh, that's what we've gone to as well, but the, the problem is the, the really critical time only happens once. So it's really an act of faith to say, I'm going to go in at four millimeters and spray something, not knowing whether I'm going to get, you know, it, it, it's easy to do where, where you have conditions that don't favor frost, but if, if there's frost potential, you're going to still do that and then take the, the risk that you, that you thin and then nature thins, you know, anyway, there's a lot of, that's, that's why we have divorce and, and hair pulling. And, and, and you know, in, in Michigan, if you go to the meetings, everybody wears hats like this, because nobody's got no hair up there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so 10 millimeters is the critical time to do the thinning. 
Um, and that's the one shot you have in a lot of varieties. Um, it's very variety specific. Uh, John of Gold, uh, Ida Reds, Jonathan to a certain extent. Um, you know, there's varieties that thin very easily and you can say, okay, one shot NAA at that time, you're good to go. Other varieties like galas, anything with golden delicious, even remotely in the parentage, galas, uh, gold rush, golden delicious, you know, they're gonna thin hard as heck. Honey crisp, same thing, hard to, th it, it, it thins, but the need to thin is so acute with honey crisp. So you, you gotta thin, and then you're saying, okay, thinning is an art as much as a science. They are making it more of a science by looking at models that predict how much carbohydrate is still there in the tank. And that is affected in a bewildering amount of, of vari by, by a bewildering amount of variables. Um, so the most critical thing, it seems like, we used to worry about the temperature pre-thinning, the temperature and the conditions for the three to four days pre-thinning. We still consider that, but it's becoming more and more clear that what's really critical is you put that NAA on. So NAA is like a shock to the system, right? It's what nature uses to, to clear off apples that it doesn't want. And we're putting extra on there and we're clumsy humans. Um, we don't have a clue of all the complexity that's going on. So uh, you put NAA on there and you get cloudy warm conditions, right? You're gonna get a lot of absorption of the NAA, number one. And at the same time, warm conditions favor growth of that fruitlet. So warm conditions mean extra stress because the plant is running on fumes anyways, and you're saying, and this little baby is saying, I want more, I want more. And at the same time, you're dumping NAA on there and it's got extra absorption. You can expect big thinning response from that. Put it on the other side and say, sunny and cold. Sunny means, and, and cold, but sunny means you're gonna have less absorption. If you have a really cloudy day, the, the spur leaves and the apple absorb more of the NA in, in, in general. And, um, it, but if it's sunny and cold, the cold weather inhibits the growth of that fruitlet, so it's not asking for as much. So you're gonna get less response. So um, that's all kind of available, like I say, on websites. Uh, Phil Schweier from Michigan State has just an excellent, excellent uh, discussion about this, and he's just a great guy anyways. Um, we use NAA and Carbaro, or seven. Um, that's our go-to. Um, if it's just a simple John of Gold, we'll use just NAA. If it's something that we know we gotta hit hard, we'll, we'll add the seven in. Um, seven Carbaro is, is uh, called a cluster buster. It'll tend to take three fruitlets down to one. Uh, NAA will tend to really pick out the weaker fruitlets. So what we're trying to do is get to where we've got like just the king bloom. If in a perfect world, like we have beautiful uh, bloom and fruit set this year, and we could go in and just the king bloom were so much ahead of everything else. It was super easy to thin. You could just hit them and everything else would fall down and the, the king bloom ones uh, survived. So like I said, there's difficult, different things. One interesting thing about some varieties like Crimson Crisp is they do seem to be somewhat self thinning. They're very, very susceptible to thinner. Um, and until two years ago, I never thinned Crimson Crisp and always had a nice steady crop, but Crimson Crisp two years ago overcropped and last year didn't have much of a crop. No, I'm sorry, three years ago they overcropped. Two years ago they had almost no return bloom and so last year when they came back heavy, I, I thinned them, but I used half rate of just NAA and over thinned them. They seem to be very, very susceptible to thinner. If you've never eaten a Crimson Crisp, you should do it. It's a great apple. Um, so like Steve was saying, if it's Goldens or Galas, we just close our eyes. We, do, we don't think too much. You, you forget about carbohydrate models. You just say, we're gonna have too many of these no matter what, and we're gonna thin them because nobody wants Galas that are the size of crab apples. They just don't. Especially when Washington grows them the size of pumpkins. All right, the dreaded fire blight. Um, bad enough in semi-dwarf trees, hugely problematic 
Um, these are Yarlington Mill, third leaf. Um, beautiful trees, we got them from Washington somehow or another. Uh, grew them up and you know, they're growing three to, putting on three to four, four foot of growth a year and boom, along comes fire. This was the worst fire blight season we've had in 10 years. Um, we just had perfect condition. But, so, um, how do you manage this disease? Because this will flat out wipe out an orchard. I mean, there's not very many things that you can say you gotta worry about that, but you're putting, you know, I think Michael's figure was $28,000 an acre into an orchard. Um, if you do a lot of the work yourself and graft it yourself, you might get it down to half of that, but it's still a lot of money, and you don't wanna see this happening. What's that? What's your rootstock there in the Um That one, it would have been either, I think it's Geneva 11. I'm pretty sure it's Geneva 11. The trees are still alive, which is what happens with these. You know, there is some idea that um, particularly strong fire blight resistance rootstocks confer a little bit of that resistance into the trees. And I think that's true, but I don't think that's true when they're in their third leaf and they're they want to grow to the moon. You know, a Yarlington mill looks like a pear tree anyway, so, you know, you want to grow it to the moon. Um, you know, they'll put on these great big suckers every year. So I think that's true, but not in a teenage tree that's wanting to grow too fast. All right, fire bike control, we're probably getting over oh, um, obviously, keep fire blight out of your orchard as long as possible. Yesterday, um, I was mentioning that there are orchards or nurseries that are willing to give you fire blight for free when you buy their trees. Um, <laughs> there's no real way to predict it, but I can say that a lot of the East Coast nurseries have battled this without naming them by name. I would just say, be careful. When you get those trees, they don't show it. You know, that bacteria can be piggybacking on there. And just be careful that you're not, that you're watching very, very uh, closely that first year of planting to make sure you're nipping it in the bud. If you see fire blight, um, okay. So there's a lot of, of uh, new information about controlling fire blight through pruning. All right, the, the, the information that I want to believe or that I act on right now, we will only prune out fire blight during a growing season if it's a containable amount. If it's that Yarlington mill tree, they do not touch it, I do not touch it, nobody touches that tree. We try to stay clear of it, we try not to hit it when we're mowing, you know, we just stay clear of it. You, there's nothing you're gonna do that's any good at, by getting in there and messing around with it. You get it on your clothing, you get it on the, on the equipment, um, nothing good. Um, there has been several really good studies to say there is absolutely zero value to trying to sterilize printer, pruners. Um, that, those cuts will, will cauterize, um, and, but generally the problem is that the fire blight's gone way beyond where you've pruned anyways. Um, if you do have a problem like those Yarlington mills, even though they're on a disease resistant rootstock, we will pull that tree out completely, but during the dormant season, okay? I, again, it's not that that's the absolute right answer, but for us, we have proven to ourselves that with these cider apple varieties in particular, getting in there, messing around does not work. All we do is spread it around. Um, just warm season pruning, do not, do not, do not do any summer pruning. Um, Apogee is one of the best materials that you can use to control fire blight. And all that does is just slow down or even shut down the growth of, of these fast growing trees. Um, Apogee is generally applied, they, <laughs> typical to, to these spray guides, they want you to apply when, um, let's see, well they want you to apply at petal fall of the king bloom, right? Yeah, like that's gonna work. But anyways, around the time of petal fall, you're gonna put your apogee on. You may put one course or you may put two or three, depend on, on uh, what you're thinking. The Geneva rootstocks are a godsend. Bud 9, I think, is a very good fire blight resistant 
or fire blight retarding rootstock, but my belief is bud nine is not so much that it's resistance itself, it's just that it's so dwarfing. Bud nine for us is like, it's like M27 used to be. It's just like super, super constricting. Again, we like to use copper early. We do use streptomycin. And streptomycin, I mean, why I'm so interested in preserving or uh, preventing resistance is streptomycin, it's just unbelievably effective. If you get, you know, if you get a, a you're on your Niwa thing and it's saying, you know, you're in full bloom and you've got 70 degrees, cloudy, no wind, and a light rain coming, you better get some strep out there because otherwise your orchard will be devastated. You put one application of strep on and it's amazing how protective that is. I will say that one thing that we've learned over the years is that when the flower first opens up, it's not really that susceptible to fire blight. It has to be really that pollen has to be pretty ripe before anything is really susceptible. So we will wait a day or two. If we think that we're gonna have a quick bloom especially, we'll try and delay that, that strep spray until right the last minute we think we can. Uh, there is a little bit of back action on strep as well. So um, we find that, that doing that allows us to just go with one strep spray a lot of years versus two. You know, I mean, there are years when you just have an extended bloom and nothing's going your way, and you need a couple of strips. Uh, explain in a minute uh, the, the full bloom with uh, a lot of pollen. Is that because your bees going to carry it? Or no, it's something physiological in the, in the flower itself. And I'm not bright enough to know exactly, and I haven't never really dug into it. But it's something about when that flower first opens up. There, there's information. I think it's Cornell's um, has done some work in this. I, I, it, could be Washington, but I, I don't really remember. But I know there's an article that talks about this where it talks about when the flower first opens up, the fire blight bacteria doesn't have a route in. And it's only when, oh, you know, I don't remember, stamen, stigma, whatever. At, at some point or another, there's a route, there's a pathway where that fire blight bacteria can move very rapidly in. And that's when you need the strep, not before that. It's, the reason this is important, again, is that there's a lot of years, you know, bloom unfortunately happens a lot of years just when it shouldn't, when conditions are ripe for fire blight. I mean, that's how the fire blight bacteria evolved, I guess. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this. I think Steve covered it very well. Um, we do have a, a lot of problems with voles. Um, so we use tree guards on everything we do. Um, we do a fall herbicide spray followed up with a summer herbicide spray. Um, we try to make, uh, we, we no longer aspire to clean, clean uh, under, under the tree. And we, like Steve, we have been narrowing. We used to have like three foot on the side of our dwarf plantings on either side, so six foot. Now we're down to about a foot on each side, maybe. 14 inches, something like that. And, you know, so that's just giving us a little bit less herbicide that we have to put on, less of a chemical wasteland there under the tree. And um, I'm really super interested to see how we can incorporate, you know, wood chips and prunings and grass blown under there. Our organic matter is not very great. You know, we run between two and 3% organic matter on our stuff and we believe since we're not doing any tillage and stuff, we should be able to get that up to five, six percent pretty easy, um, but we haven't figured out how yet. So we're, we're working on it, but we're also a little bit lazy. Um, this, you know, this, this it, it all takes work and, um, uh, yeah, gets in the way of drinking beer. Um, so, uh, yeah, we really, uh, like Steve said, that's the other thing. I, I think there's not a grower in America that is not concerned about Roundup on trees. Um, there's just been some outstanding research that suggests, uh, especially in dwarf trees, they're just not very tolerant. We've proven it to ourselves. Um, the last time we sprayed Roundup on a dwarf tree, um, it was, must have been slightly windy and we can see damage to the tree exactly starting where the, where the, the, um, the tree strip 
ended. Um, so yeah, the tree guard. I'm sorry, tree guard ended. Uh, I think I've gone and went, gone through most of that. All right, last slide here. So a couple of resources. If you guys are going to get into this, get a hold of one of the. You know, if if you're going to do it organic. Um, you're going to have to look harder, but if you want to do it uh, commercial, or even if you are going to go organic, like the Michigan Tree Guide actually now has organic um, suggestions on, on sprays. This is a very good uh, guide. I think it's like 25 bucks. Um, and if you go to the Michigan show, you can buy it there. Otherwise, you can order it online. So they'll go through, and they will explain tree row volume. They will explain, they will go through um, line by line what these different materials are they have some great guides in there about the impact of different insecticides on beneficial insects um, they have suggestions about avoiding resistance there's stuff about using uh, growth regulator you know, it's just a it's a godsend and it and it covers not just apples but peaches cherries nectarines um, brambles um, and it goes into herbicide suggestions all sorts of stuff it's a it's a go-to thing um, and talks a little about sprayer calibration as well. Michigan Hort Notes, um, those are mostly good if you're in the sort of general uh, latitude of Michigan. If you're way south of that, you should find a different source. There, there's different sources, you know. Pretty much any commercial growing area is gonna, by now, have some extension operation that goes out to growers online and says, this is what's happening in your orchard this week. You know, get off your duff, get out there and, and check this. Or it'll say, you know, like this year we had a weird thing. I, I still don't understand it, but we got frost ring on our latest blooming varieties and we didn't have any frost event that we could discern at all. And by looking at the Michigan Hort Notes, they were talking about exactly the same things. Because I, I was thinking maybe we had oversprayed copper or I didn't know what. but. Um, that's where you can get some assurance you're not the only person that's, that's seeing that. Um, I really like Cornell. A lot of the work that they've done, whether it's Terrence Robinson, uh, there was a question about uh, varieties and, and nutrient-specific recommendations. Uh, Li Liang Chang at Cornell has done some really nice work in that. Um, they have a lot of hard cider stuff, increasingly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just go to Cornell's website and this is that Niwa link um, if you just uh, google Niwa uh, you'll be able to pull up something and it's a uh, very 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 useful I think uh, for what we're doing and again you can get so if if I was to go there in March it will show me accumulated degree days for Iowa City Airport which is south of us Cedar Rapids Airport which is north of us and I can compare the two and I can see and then I can plug in um, the scab model and they will, it'll tell me when, where the, um, well, March would be too early, but let's say May, it'll tell me um, what the discharge of scab spores would have been by now, you know, because before they get above like 4%, you don't really have to worry about them. Some people say it's 6%, so there's no sense spraying too much ahead of that. You're getting too excited. Usually it's about that second spray that you got to worry about that. And, um, and then it'll show you fire blight conditions. And whether you're in a high risk or low risk, it's got several different models you can look at. Um, yeah. Do you think uh, airports get added to that? Because most of them are in the eastern. Um, I really don't know. I think maybe either talk to Cornell or talk to your airport. I don't know. I, I guess I would start with Cornell. Yeah. What was the name of the fellow at Cornell you mentioned about? Oh, Li Liang. Um, it's L I L I A N G C H A N G is his name. He's at a lot of the meetings talking about nutrition and stuff. Thank you. Yep. I think that was it. All right. So we got time questions? We do have yeah. Some one does. 
Sama ada And so they're growing like weeds? They're growing okay. They're not as big as the honey gold neck of Jerome, yeah. 119. But we got two apples since 2011. And, they and, got some and you didn't have anything in 2010? When were they planted? 2011. Um, doing the organic mycophilus. Yep, yep. I mean, but they're just not. They're not producing. Flowers. No flowers? I mean, it's, it's, I think maybe it's not a honey crisp. I, I, I've never, I mean, I've never, honey crisp always have the opposite problem. There's way more flowers than they should possibly produce. Is it the rootstocks? I mean, I don't know. Well, I mean, th that's why I'm asking about growth, because usually the problem is only attributable if it's, you know, I mean, trees are like people, right? They go through, you plant them as an infant, they go through this incredible, heady teenage thing where, you know, they're just, Hell bent for growth, you know, and they're they're gangly and all over the place and stuff like that. So in that period, you don't want to reproduce them if they're humans, anyways. But if they're trees, you also you want to fill that space, right? So you, you kind of got to work with that time and not expect fruit. And if in fact we'll take fruit off at that time, but if you're not seeing that kind of growth, then that's not the stage yet. Because when they get to be adults, especially Honeycrisp, especially any variety that I've seen on Bud 9, they go into adultum and they're just like, okay, we're gonna make fruit. That's our job now. Um, so if you're not seeing a lot of growth, and boy, I, I would say somehow or another, you've got a whole, how many varieties do you have? Like 30, it's oh. for a small organic orchard, yeah. 30, but yeah. I had an answer for you there, and now you ruined it. Because <laughs> there, there are varieties that are called triploids that need a couple of pollen sources. Um, but they still should be blooming for... That's, that's one. They're not yeah. even and, oh, you're, you're not anywhere that's like really far south, right? We're almost in Missouri. I mean, almost in Missouri. Here. No, that's not near. Were the two apples you got, were they hunting just for... Oh, yeah, I guess that's good. <laughs> were they, they were darn good. They were darn good? Were they crunchy and juicy? <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know, to be honest. I, the only thing I can think of is you, you got a tree that's not normal. You know? yeah. uh, well, I mean, it, so you know how nurseries work? They have buzzer blocks. They, they, they cut their wood. They're, they're getting their genetic material from some row of trees. And they could have easily cut them either from the wrong variety or they cut them from a tree. Because a lot of times, like... Um, uh, I used to be part of a nursery operation, and you know, it'd be like one tree that services all of the Liberty budwood for that year. And so maybe that tree is just like a, somewhat retarded. I don't know. You know what? I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Thank I'm you. sorry. You can can you score the not girdle, but score the the bark? Doesn't that increase? Uh, you can do that, but uh, if she's not seeing the vigor, like. I, I lived a long time in China, and they, they, they do that generally. They plant uh, standard rootstock, and then Fuji on top of that, which is an aggressive grower, and then they come in and they score these trees to get them to settle down because they didn't have size-reducing rootstocks. And you can do that, but you don't want to do that if you don't have vigor in your tree because that's a huge shock to the system. So, but you can, you can, may just occur, a lot of people use like a carpet knife and go around the tree, and I mean, I've known people do two or three circles around the tree if they really want to get them, but I'll tell you what, it'll shut your trees down. Um, you, you should get bloom, but you might also get bloom that has apples the size of peas, because that's the other impact of it is reduced fruit size. I, I really don't have an idea unless there's something mineral-wise I don't like you got any ideas? Sorry. I should have had better speakers. Yeah. <laughs> You're a good speaker. Um, I had two questions relating to your, your, your spray um, uh, program there. And one thing is that um, uh, on, 
on your water amount. So on those dwarf orchards, when you're early in the season doing silver tip, are you using your 50 gallon to the acre rate or are you even going like 40 or a little less? So one of the things that I learned growing up in Michigan, again, you know, it was all us teenagers out there spraying. And, and, and I kid you not, all we were thinking about was girls and beer. So we wanted to get off the sprayer as quick as possible. And my cousin learned that he could spray every other row and he got good results. So we don't, we put 50 gallons per acre on, or we, we load the sprayers and it's got 50 gallons per acre, uh -huh. but we skip every other row. So you're doing the alternate So we're rows. basically doing 25 gallons the acre, actually. Yeah. And then if you wanted three quarts to the acre, it's three quarts in that 50 gallon, if you wanted that. Yes, right? yes, Okay. exactly. Because right. that's, yeah. that's how I've learned to think of it. I've never felt confident that I understand this whole tree row volume thing. Well, the whole problem is this thing about dilute equivalent. You know, I don't know who came up with this harebrained idea about talking about it like that, but if you see, almost all the spray guides now are getting away from that, and they're talking about material per acre, whether pounds per acre, quarts per acre, whatever. Um, and, and same with the labels on our, yes. on our products? Okay. Well, because they're, they're, I know, some yeah, you don't know, they, are they, they vary, thinking yeah. in the 400 to, you know, 400 These guesses. are not the most okay. progressive people in the world putting a lot of this stuff together. <laughs> okay. And then the other question was just on your, you had spray oil. Are you going after aphids? Um, or what are you going after with that? And then I've also wondered, when you're doing a spray oil that early in the season, how is that affecting the egg masses that could be out there from our beneficial insects? So we put spray oil on, we don't always do that. We put it on only as a way to extend our copper a little bit. It's um, not a heavy rate. It's not intended to be like a dormant oil or anything like that. We got away from that a long time ago because most of what you're getting, unless you have scale as a problem, uh -huh. um, most of what you're killing is the good guys. You right. know, most of what you're smothering, you don't want to be smothering. Yeah. And plus, the ones that you're smothering, the bad guys, the, the good guys will take care of them anyway. So you just, I, I, I've been, we have a, a group of us that buy spray materials together. And there's several people whose dads who are, you know, again, it goes down, they grew up in the business and they had always put oil on, I got to put oil on. I, I just don't think it's, for us, it's not something we're going to They were using that to try to expand, like, uh, or extend the copper hydroxide? No, oh. that's what we do. Uh -huh. They were trying to do it as a dormant oil spray, which is a much heavier oil, by the way. I mean, this is a spray oil, it's really light. It's a, uh, and uh, it, it just helps your copper efficiency a little. Yeah, yeah. And you want to be careful if you're doing it like we do. That's why I said we don't always do it. If we're getting like a really fast growth, if it's a cool spring and we're going from silver tip, and, you know, a week later we're starting to see a little green, and a week later it's eighth inch, then I'll put oil in there because I know it's got, I'm, I'm going to be safe. But if it's something where it's pushing right along, I'll take the oil out because it, you can really get some rusting from by that it really does help extend the life of the copper and if your copper goes on to some of this real susceptible tissue that comes after the tip of the bud comes out you're going to get some rusting on the fruit yeah and then for if you're doing it for cider like i am you don't care, you don't care. yeah so. they, they, I, yeah yeah and, and uh in england where they also have fire blight and stuff like that on copper on uh, cider varieties they use a lot of copper and there's some new formulations of copper too that are much lighter and that you can use later in the season. My quiver. Yeah, my quiver. Yeah, that's my friend. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about your thinning. So like the, uh, the NAA and the carbaryl that you were mentioning is not on your spray sheet here. So I know you said you hit a couple of varieties, or, you know, some of those varieties a couple times. But as far as the rate goes, does that ever change according to the density and the root stock that you've got? Um, not so much, <coughs> okay, I, well, okay, so with thinning, the more water you can put on, the better, but we're kind of tied into 50 gallons per acre. Now, a good grower would have his sprayer set up to where he could put on twice or even three times that amount of water and really cover the tree. 
okay? Because thinners work best when there's absolutely perfect coverage. There's no question about that. Um, having said that, um, we even concentrate thinners. So that's something we haven't talked about. I didn't want to get too complicated, but we actually, you know, 50 gallons a acre, we're running what's called a concentrate program, about 3X concentrate. Um, so with thinners, we'll also concentrate the thinners um, and use that 50 gallons per acre rate. I think your question is, can we vary the amount that we do on trees? And we do that by varying the concentration. So um, NAA, typically um, 10 parts per million, um, which is like uh, four ounces of fructone N um, per acre. So that's 10 parts per million, and that's like the standard. Okay, if I was doing ginger gold or John of Gold or I don't know, Jonathan's, generally speaking, I would probably run 10 parts per million if, if it's a normal year. Um, and then if I was doing galas or golden type varieties or honey crisp, I would add to that 10 parts per million a quart per acre of seven hard bark. Um, if I was really worried about it, I might take it from 10 parts up to 15 parts and still add the seven. If I was really worried about over thinning, like on the Crimson Crisp, next year I'm gonna run like three parts, just enough. So there, there's, the thing about NAA that's great is that it encourages return blue. And um, I guess this, I, this is a good time to talk about that. But, so they, they say like at five parts per million, you will start to encourage the formation of fruit buds, even if you have more fruit that year, because normally a, a, a tree, <coughs> as soon as it's set in those, is, uh, you know, by the time bloom is over, it's already pretty much decided how much, how many um, uh, fruit buds to set for the next year. It's based on the uh, number of seeds that the fruitlets are producing and, and feedback mechanisms in there. So uh, you can trick it by adding a little bit of NAA early on. Um, the better program is if you want to just worry about return bloom, like, okay, I'm done with my thinning and my galas are overcropped, or better yet, my honey crisp are overcropped. I know I'm not going to have a crop next year if I don't do something. We will add five parts per million in our cover sprays two weeks apart, starting in about uh, June, late June. We'll, we'll add that in. And it's, it no longer acts as a thinner, it's just to encourage return blooms. That's a really good program. But yeah, the answer to your question is, yes, you can do, um, you can change the rate to adjust thinning. And that's, but like I say, it's just, it's such a, a you're just, it's like the religion. You're just believing it because somebody told you to, right? I mean, it's not easy to know if it's actually doing it. Now, there is thinning models that you'll see online where um, they will have you go out and actually write numbers onto these fruitlets and monitor them for like a week and check growth with a digital micrometer. And this is a you know fairly scientific way to do this. And you can you can then chart, and there's spreadsheets that Phil Schweier and other people have put together, you can chart the growth of those fruitlets, and you, you will see which apples are gonna fall off by themselves way before there's, you, you're, you can see it with your eye. Um, there's some really good stuff, but I mean, this is so much like work. I had my son working for me, and I mean, he wore me out bitching about how much, you know, that this is so tedious, and you know, you're doing like hundreds of fruitlets each day with a digital micrometer, and hard to get good measurements, and so Anyway, I, I don't think that's the answer, but right now, it's the best information. Would you comment on Maxell as a thinner? Maxell as a thinner, yeah, it's a great thinner, and it's uh, it's really good if you get into some stuff that's gotten beyond, you know, I mean, NAA only really gets you up to about 15 part, about 15 millimeters before it becomes really ineffective. Maxell, can work really well early on. It can also work really well later on. The other advantage to Maxell, if you put NAA on and it's a good day, 
you know, in terms of absorption, that tree will sag. I mean, it just looks like you beat it up, you know, and uh, Maxell doesn't have quite as big an impact that way, but Maxell has been proven to have good results. We have not used a lot of Maxell for that. We use it more for encouraging branching in young trees, but not so much in thinning. Um, those guys out in Washington, Michigan, and New York, that they're doing a lot better stuff with that than, than we are in our orchard. But it is an excellent dinner. And you'll see Cornell has some outstanding stuff on use of Max L. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your um, understory spray program. You said that you had one fall spray, one summer spray. So around when does your summer spray go on? What does your weed pressure look like then? And then what does your weed pressure look like at the end of the season? So I have good questions. And I will be the first to admit, we've only done fall weed sprays. This will be the, this is the third season that we're coming back from a fall weed spray. The results are incredible. I mean, it's just like night and day. It's not just that you, you're, you don't have to get back in when you're trying to do a bunch of other work and, and you know, it, it, it keeps you out of the orchard for that. Month of May, that's a nice thing. So we're going back in about June generally, I mean, but it just depends on the year, but it's, you know, we, we try to never go in on top of anything that's more than six inches tall. Um, but increasingly, we are trying to let stuff grow up to four to six inches before we go back and do it. Um, and um, I'm sorry, what was the second point? Well, yeah, I guess the reason I asked is because I just can't imagine, in, you know, from where I'm doing, you know, our program, if I only sprayed in June, by the time July came around or August, like the weed pressure would just be incredible. So what we found, and, and I, uh, herbicide spraying is one area where we do some, some touch-up work, um, and that usually comes in late July, something in that range, but mostly, like Steve said, what you're really spraying for in the summer, and it's kind of an act of faith, is you're putting pre-emerges on for grasses because that's the that's what wants to take over underneath your tree um, you know as the as the season warms up as temperatures warm up um, and I'll be the first to admit we're not there yet but one of the things is that you know there was some uh, there used to be a great publication on New Zealand called Hort News and they did some outstanding research in New Zealand early on. And one of the things that interested me always was they did a study where they compared, like, not putting any, or not, not having a clear strip under young trees and then not having a clear strip under bearing trees. And they could find a lot of difference on the young trees, but they could find no appreciable difference in yield or size of fruit with a completely mowed understory versus a um, herbicide strip, and uh, you know, and they were serious about that. It wasn't some flighty operation. Either. So, I mean, I, I think we could get away with a lot more than we think. Yeah. Put it that way. But you're still. Um, so when you do spray in June, when you're getting into harvest season, you're finding that your leaves are still below the canopy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. As long as we're spraying for grasses. If you don't. You know, the grass will be up, we get a lot of foxtail, and then, you know, that foxtail will be up two and a half, three foot tall. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely have some other things that are yeah. just, I can't really need to it's a, I mean, we have a lot of things that will just be too, too tall. tall. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and, and it, it's, you know, you may need two sprays, but uh, okay. that's what we're trying to, every spray that we get rid of, we're trying to get rid of. Uh, yeah. What do you normally do? Stop well, so that's an interesting question. Uh, we we stop. We never spray because we have a U pick operation. We always uh, and we open the first of August, so we always try to stop by the middle of July. Um, and do we get some city blocks on late varieties on a year like this? Yep, we do. And we tell people that's why we got it because we don't want to be spraying in there. Uh, anywhere as close to harvest time. Um, we have a commercial orchard that's um, for retail sales, but even there, like I said, with the exception of some of these, we're, we're starting to see some black rot coming in on some of this stuff, but 
before we saw that, we really didn't see a lot of reason. I mean, it was because we went into this UPIC operation and found out that we could stop spraying, even on these big semi dwarf trees, we could stop spraying middle of July and not have a lot of sooty blotch and fly speck. And I think the reason is because Iowa is a lot drier than Michigan. You know, you don't have the same, uh, well, until the corn gets up, but you know, you have wind, stuff dries quicker here, I think. That's my belief. And, you know, coupled with having a smaller canopy with dwarf trees, you get away with it. Now with the black rot, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what we're gonna end up with. 